If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I always wonder how I'm going to approach Christmas season. And uh, this is not what I had planned, but the Lord uh, has better plans than I do. And I'm grateful for that. I was sitting in the back waiting for Kristen. I was going to come, come on around and uh, did the fevers back there. And Robert had his hand over his wife, like leaning on, on her, you know, with his arm around her. And Jonathan had his arm around Emily exactly the same way. <laughs> leaning. I said, twins. Twins, father and son. Isn't that cool? A likeness. And they had they didn't plan that. I want to be like my dad. I want to be like my heavenly father. I want to just uh, take his traits and just make them my own. And the thing is, is that God is just so happy to be walking with us and we can just enjoy this time together. I'm not going to take a lot of time getting into the introduction and I'm not going to read all the scripture at first. So um, I'm not going to make you stand. We're going to cover a lot of the chapter together. So if y'all are ready, let's just jump after it. Verse 1 says this, Luke 1, verse 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us. I don't know how many. But evidently, a lot of people wanted to write down the things about Christ, the things that they knew, the things that they saw, so that they can be remembered. So that, the, but, but we have the Gospels. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and two of which were written not by eyewitnesses, but, but second account sick from someone else, but God put those things together. And in verse 2, it says, just as those who were um, from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word delivered to them. He said, but it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account. And Luke was a, a very much just a one right after the next. He's Dr. Luke. So you know that he's precise. You know that he wanted to uh, put things in a perfect order. And he wrote these things to uh, a, a person that says at the end of verse 3 is named Theophilus. But I love what he called him most excellent, Theophilus. Nobody ever calls me most excellent, Brian. There's probably a really good reason for that. He said that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. So Luke wrote Luke and Acts. But he didn't really come in until the halfway through the book of Acts. And he wanted to, uh, uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the leadership of God, he wanted to put these things in order for not just Theophilus, but for you and I, so that we could know these things as well. It's unique to know that he was writing down Jesus' story. But you have a story too. You've got a story. You've got a life. It's about you. Um, now, when Luke wrote this down, he was going to make sure that everything was perfectly put together because the Jews, they were, they were really wanting to make sure that, that everything was exactly right when, when you log these things in. And this is beginning in chapter 1. It's the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were a Jewish family. And like I said, they kept up with all these things, all the begats, who, you, who was from who and who came from who and who came from who and who came from who. And, and that continued on until A.D. 70 when Rome came in and destroyed Jerusalem. So all those records, all the way back to Adam, right? All those records stopped A.D. 70. So people today, you know, they're, they're talking about the Messiah must come from the tribe of Judah. Well, nobody knows who's of the tribe of Judah today. But we know Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So these things, these stories, were uniquely put forth in this period of time. I just want you to know your story is unique for your period of time. It's being recorded as well. Every little thing about it. God is watching. It's your life. God sees you. God knew who your parents were going to be. 
who your grandparents are going to be, who your great-grandparents are going to be, who your great-great and all those and where you came from here. Lynn and I gave her a present for Christmas. I actually, I gave it to her a few years ago. She and I both. We did 23 and Me, right? You spit, or you actually don't spit. You just swab your mouth, and you send it in, and they give you your DNA, right? I found out all the people I'm kin to. I'm kin to people from all over, uh, mostly English with a name like Stevens. You can understand that. I had a grandparent that was a whitehead, so you know we got the we got the English lineage in us, but I got a lot of Scottish in me. I got some Irish. But by the way, I've also got some Pakistani in me. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, by the way, in your family, you probably got something crazy in your family too. Can I get an amen? We're just a product of all those things that have gone on before us, but it's just our life. It's, it's the things that, that happen to us that are really not chance. Not chance at all. My dad went to World War II. He left mom pregnant. My oldest brother was born. My dad didn't see him until he was two years old. But God knew that Brian was coming later on down the road. My dad was uh, uh, in the back of a, I don't know whatever those big military vehicles are. And uh, the guy beside him got shot, and dad had a canteen right under his arm. You know, they have the little thing, and it was right under his arm. He got shot right through his canteen, but it didn't hit him. You know why? Brian was coming. Brian was coming. You know, here's the deal. Though dad was right there at the front, he was really immortal till God called his name to come home. Nothing really happens by chance because God's hands are there. God's hands are involved in your life. God knows all the little things that are going on in your life. He knows all those little things that are happening. And, and He knows your desires. I'm going to say the word. He knows your dreams. Look what it says in verse 5. There was in the day of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughter of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. When they knew all these things down. Verse 6, they were both righteous before God, walking in all His commandments and ordinances of the, of the Lord blameless. Now, let me just tell you here. It says they were both righteous before God. That doesn't mean they were perfect. They were sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Y'all good with that? When it says in walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, they were blameless. That means their heart was in the right place. It doesn't mean that they were perfect, but they wanted to do the right thing. They came up short, and how many of you know that we should all have a desire for repentance in our life? We should live daily with that uh, kind of being a, a crescendo in our life. We should all want repentance because we're all going to sin. But when we do sin, we do repent. We, stay, we try to get back on the path as quickly. And that's really what was going on in Zach, uh, Zechariah and, and Elizabeth's life. Verse 7, but they had a need. They had a dream. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. I'm grateful that the Bible didn't tell us uh, what that age was because once we got there, we know we were well advanced in years. Some of y'all are recycled teenagers. Amen? Some of y'all have the youngest hearts around. You're just a, a teenager at heart, and, and I love it. I don't want you to grow up, right? You just stay the people that God made you to be. So here they are, but they had a dream. They got married, you know, and they probably thought like every young couple, we'll have kids one day. And you're going to plan those things and we're going to have this kind of a home and it's going to be so nice and we'll have 12 children. Women never pray that prayer. <laughs> Men might, right? 12 kids? I don't know. But we, we're going to have a family together. Now, the, Family was huge in that day. As a matter of fact, family was so big that sometimes that there would be two or three generations living in one house. How many of y'all are grateful we don't do that today? Right? 
But yet, when a husband and wife did not have kids, they was frowned upon. And when a woman did not have a child, she was seen as less than a woman. Any of y'all women feel that? I, I don't know anything about it, but I, I understand that their, their biological clock is ticking. They're, they're saying, oh, I've got to have a child by. You know, it did funny how in this particular case and in uh, uh, Abraham and Sarah's life, God has a sense of humor. Oh, you're going to have a child. You're just going to have to wait on it a while. How many of y'all look forward to having a child at 90 years of age? How many of y'all just look forward to making it to 90 years of age? How many of y'all don't want to make it to 90 years of age? So God knows all these things, but they, time went by and the dream didn't come true. And they stayed faithful. They stayed righteous. They, they did what they were supposed to do. They, they tried to, with a repentant heart, follow God and all of His ordinances. But there was, even a woman wanted to have a child, but she really wanted to have a son to carry on the family name. And they didn't have it. You think they forgot the dream? Do you ever? I mean, we talked about it this morning in Sunday school. You might push those dreams down. You, you might forget those dreams. You, you may say, well, there's something else. But in your heart of hearts, is it still there? You see, when your thoughts and God's thoughts come together, when your plans and God's plans come together, and you may not understand this, but the dreams that you have now, God knew them before you were born. He gave you your DNA. He gave you the color of your hair, the color of your eyes. He gave you the wants of your heart. And when you came to be a believer, He wanted to pour out all of His blessings, all of His grace on you. His desire is to bless you. His desire is for you to be totally ecstatically happy. Hilariously, the word is. Happy. And how can that be if somewhere in the back of your heart you're pricked because your dream has not come true? Well, look what happens here in verse number 8. So it was that while he was serving as priest, that is Zacharias, he's there in the temple before God in the order of his division, according to the custom in the priesthood, his lot failed to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So it was his turn. They took turns. It took lots, right? Yeah, one will do it then, then the next one. So it's his, it's his duty time. And he's there in the temple. And it says that, that he is inside the temple burning in incense. Outside, verse 10, the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the house, at the, excuse me, at the hour of incense. So he's inside praying. They're praying outside. Incense is a symbol of our prayers being lifted up to God. Burn before God, a sacrifice, and we are a sacrifice, and we make our prayers known before God. So he's probably praying for all the Jews. He's probably paying, praying for the 12 tribes. He's probably praying for, the, for the, uh, the, 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 the leaders in the Sanhedrin. He's probably praying for all these things. He's praying for, for God's will to be done in all these people's lives. But you know, somewhere in there, his heart had to get in there too. When you pray... You're pouring out your heart before God. But he was in there for a long time, and you think his dreams got brought back up. You think a tear may have fallen from his face and said, Lord, I love you, I worship you, even though... Y'all ever prayed an even though prayer? Things didn't come out the way I, 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 I thought they were supposed to. My dream looks different now than it did before. Now, church, what happens is God puts the seed of a dream in us, 
But for our dream to become his dream, listen to me now. I'm not preaching loud this morning in my throat, right? So y'all just bear with me here. When our dream and God's dream comes together, that marriage of God's will and our will, are you listening? God's going to take our dream and refine it to his dream. And he's going to take his dream and pour it into our hearts. Now, it's not necessarily replacing because he knew it from the beginning. But when I was a kid, we were talking about this in Sunday school, I was either going to be, you know, what every kid either was going to be a firefighter or an astronaut, or I wanted to play left field for the Atlanta Braves. I guess because Hank Aaron played left field for the Atlanta Braves. I don't know. Maybe I just wanted to be out there and people cheering me and when I hit the home run, I don't know. But I, I'm 61. I'm not going to play left field for the Atlanta Braves. They're not going to look for me. I mean, I may be so bold to just say, can I come try out? And they'll laugh and say, really? There's other places you can go to those camps and pay money and they'll let you hit a ball. No, not, not here. You can't do that, right? But God, when he starts, listen, who knows every ache, whisper, prayer, dream of our heart, and he comes in with his hand of blessing. See, my dream may be in a box that I've made for it. This is my box. I want it to be just this way, right? So God says, no, 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 let me knock the side off that. Let, 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 let me knock the side off of, on this side. Let, let, me, let me change. And, and when we get down to it, he'll get to the real thing. And if the seed, come on now, listen. If the seed will die in Christ, what happens to a seed when it dies? There's a regeneration. There's new life. Dreams don't go to die. They get all the excess knocked off of it so that God can take it. And when we die to that dream in Christ, He will bring it forth hundredfold. Joseph had a dream. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. You remember the dream? By the way, <clears throat> that was God's dream for him. He didn't dream it. He told his brothers about it. They didn't like it. Matter of fact, they sold him off into slavery and treated him as if he was dead. And when he got there, he became a slave and he blessed God in that situation. And, and he got thrown in prison. But when he got thrown in prison, he, he blessed God and God blessed him. And he became second in charge of all of Egypt. And he never thought that that would be the path that he would get to for his dream to be fulfilled. But it's exactly what happened. God had to knock a wall off of it here. God had to knock a wall off of it here. But God began to bloom some things that were there. And when Joseph died in Christ for his will to be God's will, when Jesus, <clears throat> come on, was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, <clears throat> not my will, Thy will be done. When he died in Christ, when he died in God, when he, when he died to the Father's will, God took that, the death of the cross, and it abounded. Moses was born and raised in Pharaoh's family, but he always knew he was different. And yet when he got to that age where he tried to find out who he was, right, and, and, and tried to live the reality of who he was, all it did was get him in trouble. To the place that he had to run for his life. And God took him to the backside of the desert for 40 years. You see, God had to knock off some walls. God had to get it down to that place. If you had asked Moses at that point in time, it wasn't to, to change Egypt. 
It wasn't just to change the Jewish people, the Hebrew people who were enslaved in Egypt. He was just saying, I guess I got to be the best shepherd I can be out here on the backside of the desert. But God met him at the right time, at the right place. Come on. And when Moses died to his will, but God's will, he took the dream that he probably had dreamed his whole life and he, he, he blew it up. And the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt. And by the way, they're still being blessed. And I don't care what Hamas or all those other people are trying to do. God's got his hand of blessing on Israel. God will always bless Israel. Jesus is coming back and it says that Israel will be saved in a day. God has a plan for those people. And he has a plan for us through those people. My Savior was a Jew. He redeemed the world, though, and I got to be a part of that. His dream was bigger. Do you think David out there in the, in, in the fields at night being forgotten up by, by, really, by his parents, just him and the sheep out there at night, you think he ever dreamed a dream? You think God met him there? Some of those psalms that he wrote as a teenager, worshiping God, that we still read today. And he, I don't believe it was in his wildest imagination that Samuel would come and anoint him as king. But then he went back to the field. And yes, he stood up to, to Goliath, and Goliath fell. But he still wasn't on the throne over 20 years before he got to the throne. It wasn't the way he thought of it, but we're still talking about David today, aren't we? Because God's will and his will came together. Now don't stop. Listen to me, church. Please hear this. God knows your dream. He placed it there. He uniquely made you to fulfill. You're gifted toward it. It's His grace abounding love for you. He wants to pour out. God loves you so much. He wants to put a smile on your face forever. So don't miss this, church. He's able to pour His grace upon you when we die to His will. And His will takes our dream and makes it explode in grace. Zacharias may have been praying, you forgot me. I pray for everybody else, but what about my wife at home? Have you forgotten her tears? It didn't come out the way I thought it was going to. Lord, I'll serve you here, yes. But I have a dream. Let me just give y'all a, um, a word. Y'all remember the impossibles that we talked about in church? The impossibles, I-M-P-O-S-S-I-B-L-E, that because of him become a impossible, they can only become possible because of him. I did that over 10 years ago. My wife carried hers in her Bible. She updated it when we came here and we did the impossibles here. But she still got the other one. And by the way, I dreamed some big dreams. I wanted to be totally out of debt. Totally out of debt. We had debt, folks. I wanted to be totally out of debt by the time I was 60 years, by the time I was 59 years old. You know what time I got out of debt? when I was 59 years old. It was stacked against me. Y'all know what it means when everything's stacked against you? But when the cards started to hit the table, when the things came through, when I got that one phone call, and I said, pay it off. Pay it off. My house, all the land's paid for. You know the only thing I owe for my truck? You know why I haven't paid it off? Because it's that point is 0.9% interest rate, and I figured I'll use their money instead of my money. 
I'm just letting it grow. I could pay it off. I got enough money in the bank, I could pay it off today. You know, that was a God thing. Now, you may not say, you say, oh, pastor, that's just nothing. That was my impossible. That if you knew my circumstance, you would understand that it was a impossible only. And by the way, someone else in this church reminded me of one of my other impossibles. Lance, what was it, a few weeks ago? He's up there just smiling. And I said, that's right, Lord. This coming, this Thanksgiving, right? This Thanksgiving that we just passed and the two days after is when I surrendered to preach, folks. And I told God that I would preach, but he was going to have to come through. I wanted, to, I wanted somebody else to confirm it. I preached between Christmas and New Year's, and this lady that was about that tall and about that round came up to me and hugged me like I've never been hugged. And she said, God told me to come up here and tell you that if you ever doubt that you're called into the ministry, that God told me to tell you not to doubt it, you are unmistakably called into ministry. That's what I was praying for, was somebody to confirm it, somebody that I never knew, somebody I'd never seen before, somebody I have not seen since. I'll see her when I get to heaven one holy day. But God just wanted me to know it's there. There was something else that I prayed that I haven't seen yet. I want a revival, folks. I want something that's unmistakably Christ. I don't want something that's man-made. I don't want something that's promoted up. I want it heaven sent down. I want something that cannot be confined by a church or a person. I don't want someone to say, oh, that's what happened there, or oh, that's what happened there. I want, to, I want somebody to say, this is what God's going to do. This is heaven sent. I want to see something like I've read about in the books, like I've seen in the churches. I, I, I preached at a church one time and they talked about the revival that went on for weeks and weeks. And, and yes, they were jumping pews. I've never seen anybody jump a pew on purpose. They talked about walking the pews. Now, if y'all walk the pews, we're going to have trouble. I mean, they went from one pew to the next, walking the pews in church. You, I'm not looking for that. They had baptism by the river and men crawled up in the tree like Zacchaeus. But I'm told that they were jumping from limb to limb. I'm not looking for broken arms. But I'm looking for whatever put it in their heart to make them want to walk the pew or make them climb up a tree and be jumping from limb to limb because of the outrageous excitement of what God was doing in their midst. That's what I want to see. I've read about it. I've prayed about it. How many of y'all wanted to see something like that? Lynn has these things in our kitchen. I think one of the kids gave it to us. It was one of those, you turn it every day and it's got a new thing. And, and, and yesterday said, if you're praying that God move a mountain, don't be surprised when he gives you a shovel. <laughs> I'm ready to do my part where God's dream and my dream comes together. Now, see, my dreams of a young preacher and my dreams of today are different, but yet the, 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 after you knock the walls off of it and after God can shape it down, it's really the same thing. I just want to see an outpouring of the blessings of God. Unmistakably, I don't want any praise for it. I don't, I don't want, no, I just want it to be unmistakably Jesus. Sometimes when it seems the most unlikely, God gets the most glory out of it. Well, I got to go quick. Verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Oh, hold on. He's, he's praying. He's in the temple, burning incense. Maybe a tear falling down his face. An angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. Well, duh. How many of y'all have seen an angel? Every one of y'all have. Because we see angels unaware. You have bumped into them all over the place, and they just look like ordinary people or things, and you just didn't see it. But I believe this is Gabriel. It says it in, in, in verse number uh, 19, it's Gabriel. 
Gabriel is coming from the presence of God. So I think he looks like what you think of, like Ezekiel described. I think he looks like the cherubim of God, and I think he is there in the presence. And, and, and Zacharias looked at him and said, oh my goodness. I think this is a little bit of Isaiah chapter number 6 when he saw the, the cherubim there hovering. With two wings, they covered their face. Two, they covered their feet. And with two, that he's flying. I think he saw something that was so out of this world, he thought, I'm scared to death of this thing. And I would be too, and so would be you. But he says here, the verse, Gabriel says to him, verse 13, the angel said to him, do not be afraid. That's the one thing that's crazy. He, you know he's going to be afraid, right? But he's like, no, 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 I come in peace. And I believe just as the incense filled that room with worship, I believe peace filled his room as well. And he said, for your prayer is heard. If you don't get anything else, I just want you to know this. Your prayer was heard. God's not too busy on the throne. I don't care how small it is. I don't care how big it is. I don't care how weird it is. I don't care. God knows your heart. He formed you in this way. Please, it. Please, please, please. He wants you to have that dream. He wants to make it come alive in your life. Well, I've always wanted to... He knows. Your prayer is heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you shall call his name John and you will have glad, joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. <laughs> I was with you when you said... I'm the angel of the Lord. I, I, I was with you there. I, I know you're unmistakably God. And I'm very grateful that, that, you, that God heard my prayer. But you're going to do what? Abraham knew what he was talking about. 100 years old. I mean, he was slow getting started, but he was a father of many nations. Right? Hmm. Listen to me real quick. I want to share this with you. When God answers our dream, He does Ephesians 3.20, that which is exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or ask. Look what it says. Verse 15. This is the for He will. Jeremiah 29.11 I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. There's some things that God's plans and, and, and Zachariah's plans have come together and now he's going to hear, not only I'm going to give you a boy, but I, I want you to hear what this boy is going to be like. He will be great in the sight of the Lord. Shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. Number two, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. He will turn many of their children of Israel to the Lord their God. Number four, he will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You wanted a boy. I'm going to give you a boy. Zachariah says, how am I going to know this? I'm an old man. My wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God who was sent to speak to you before these and bring you these glad tidings. We've got to accept the dream. Not forget the dream. Some of you need to resurrect the dream. It's not too late. Moses was 80 when God spoke to him in a burning bush. It wasn't too late. Abraham was 100. He was 75 at the Ur of the Chaldees when he left home. He was 100 when Isaac was born. It's not too late. 
Some of you are dreaming for your children, for your family, for your grandchildren. Carolyn back there for her great-grandchildren, Bo Buck Brown, <laughs> great-grandchild born Thanksgiving Day. That's a name. Bo Buck Brown. I like it. You think God has plans for Bo? You think God's going to honor Bradley Elliott's prayers for Decker, his father, and do it in Bo? Come on. You think those prayers that can be answered? I honestly believe that I am a preacher today because of a Methodist grandmother who stood this tall. She had three boys that were Baptist preachers. I think we're from the tribe of Levi. All the grandchildren that she had that were preachers, exceedingly abundantly above. She never met me, but I'm going to meet her. And I'm going to carry the fruit of her prayers with me to heaven. Y'all good with that? If we die to our ability to make it happen, and we open ourselves up to the possibilities of what God can do, don't stop praying. Don't stop believing. Don't stop trusting. Don't give up on the verge of a miracle. It's who you are. It's how He made you. It's how He wants His will to be done. A virgin girl gave birth to our Savior. That doesn't make sense unless God's involved. Your dream may not make sense unless God's involved. I, my time's gone. Can we just chat for a second? God knows the dream for you. Just because I said time's gone, y'all start to get ready to walk out the door. I'm not talking about just Gerald, too. Gerald, you put in a coat when you want to. But listen to me. <laughs> Satan knows that you have a dream, too. And he's going to do everything that he can to get you to discard it. He's going to, he's going to tell you you're not worthy of it. He's going to tell you you can't make it happen. He's going to tell you it's a waste of time. It's a waste of prayers. He's going to try to discourage you. And He will send people into your life to discourage you. He will, he will send people into your life to speak against you. He will send people into your life that will show you all your little picadillos, all your little deficits, all your ugliness, all of your sins, all of that horror, and you're going to think, why would God ever do something like that in me? The Holy Spirit is the comforter. Satan is the discourager. Are you going to believe the, the truth of God? Or are you going to believe the lie of the devil? Are you going to give up? Or are you going to give in to God? Church, if we have revival, it will be when God comes to bless us. And when God blesses us, don't think that He's going to change us so that He can bless us. He'll change us on the inside, but He's going to use us as we are. He made us this way. We're already designed for His dream. We don't have to go get the popular people. We don't have to... I mean, we just take an old empty cup and let him fill it up and let it overflow and spill on everybody around us. But if Satan discourages us and tells us it won't happen, it can't happen, then it's not going to happen.
I believe Zacharias was praying that day, and I believe God heard him and said, Gabriel, go tell him what I'm about to do. And Gabriel shows up and says, God's heard your prayer. This is what God's going to do. My prayer today is for you, that you would know that God loves you. God's heard your prayer. It's as important to Him as any other prayer in all the world. And if you'll meet Him, He'll meet you.